So the first question is, uh, we've noticed that a range of changes were made to the bill before it, mm. it passes the third reading. And the most significant one is uh, you have uh, excluded uh, those with uh, grievers and uh, uh, irreme mm. irremediable mm. medical conditions mm. from mm. those mm. eligible for assisted dying. Mm. So why this change? Um, democracy <laughs> is about finding agreement and when we introduced the bill, uh, it would allow a person with a grievous and irremediable medical condition uh, to be eligible for assisted dying. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a concept that came from Canada, mm -hmm. and it meant that a person with Huntington's disease, for example, mm -hmm. um, who wasn't going to die immediately, could still ask to, to end their life. Um, the Green Party, and some MPs from the National and Labour Party uh, said, no, we cannot support that, it's too wide. Um, so we made an agreement that the bill would be changed to only allow people uh, with a terminal condition uh, to access assisted dying. So now the rules say you can't have an assisted death unless uh, two doctors independently agree that you have a terminal illness likely to end your life uh, within six months. So we narrowed the bill um, to get agreement from politicians, uh, and that's democracy. Oh, I see. Uh, I just uh, noticed you said you, uh, we have not enough support. Mm. What do you mean by don't have enough support? Well, to, to pass the bill, I needed to get a majority of 61 out of 120 um, or more. Um, mm -hmm. In the end, we got 69 votes, um, but if we hadn't made changes and agreements, uh, we could have easily lost 9 or 10 votes, mm -hmm. and then instead of getting more than 61, uh, we might have only got 59 votes or 58 uh, if we'd lost the Green Party and other MPs' support, then the bill would have been a failure and we would have got nothing. And the bill will be, uh, whether the bill will become more or will be decided by a referendum. Mm. And, uh, mm, but uh, some people don't like the referendum. Mm. Mm. They said uh, it is the member of parliament's job mm. to make difficult con uh, decisions. Mm. So uh, what do you say about it? Mm. Well, I think people forget that the members of parliament have been debating this bill uh, for 23 months almost two years, from the 13th of December 2017 to the 13th of November 2019. Mm -hmm. Parliament has never worked harder on a bill uh, than it's worked on this bill. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, uh, people will say, well, why not make the final decision? Well, New Zealand first said that they would not vote for the bill unless there was a referendum clause. So what it means now is that Parliament's done its job. We have passed a piece of legislation. Um, it's now up to the people to say yes or no uh, to that law coming into force. And I think we've got the best of both worlds. So we've got rigorous parliamentary scrutiny of the law, uh, and we've got a choice to the people at a referendum. So we've got both. Mm. And I've noticed that uh, uh uh, some people say the re referendum question, question will be whether are you uh, whether you support mm. the bill become law mm. rather than support assisted dying. Mm. So what kind of questions were included in the So referendum? the parliament has decided what the question will be mm -hmm. and it will be do you agree with the End of Life Choice Act 2019 mm -hmm. coming into force? Mm -hmm. um, so you know, either uh, you agree um, or you disagree. Uh, and you can tick a box that says yes I agree or no I don't agree. Um, so the, the question is very clear um, and people I think are very aware of what the End of Life Choice Act is because it's been discussed so widely, it's been one of the number one news stories in the political media for the last two years. And uh, one of the most common criticisms of the bill is that uh, the patients will see pressure uh, to do assisted dying. And the bill also regulates that the doctors should stop the process of assisted dying when they find the pressure. So uh, it's kind of subjective though. So are there any um, 
measures to stop this from happening, to make it more objective? Mm. Well, first of all, um, we have 20 years of experience and evidence from countries such as the Netherlands, Belgium, the United States uh, state of, of Oregon. You know, they've had this law for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so we can ask ourselves, you know, do these scary things actually happen? Or are they just things that people who don't like the bill um, like to talk about? Mm -hmm. And we know from the international evidence that this idea of people getting pressured um, doesn't happen if you have a bill like ours. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that, of course, um, there's always going to be judgment involved. Uh, so you know, a doctor has to decide uh, if, in their view, the person is making the best decision. Um, that's, that's how the law works. Um, I think that the law is extremely rigorous and stringent. Um, but of course, you know, all laws depend on people doing their job. Um, many, uh, some people vote against the bill, especially mm. doctors. Mm. Um, they, they, they don't want to be part of the assisted mm. dying. Mm. They think the bill will weaken the doctor and patient relationship mm. uh, because the relationship is uh, based on trust and mm. respect. Mm. So uh, it is possible that mm. if the bill becomes mm. law, mm. there are uh, many doctors, mm. doctors who refuse mm. to take mm. part in it. Yeah, well, first of all, on the question of trust in the doctor-patient relationship, we can ask ourselves, you know, there's countries where assisted dying has been legal for 20 years, mm -hmm. and what's that done to the doctor-patient relationship in those countries? You know, do people not trust their doctors in the Netherlands after 20 years? Mm -hmm. uh, of course they trust their doctors. The Royal Dutch Medical Association supports their legislation. Um, so we can look at what's actually happened overseas, and we find that the criticisms in New Zealand uh, are wrong. Uh, number two, um, I, I disagree with you that doctors are up against the bill. Some doctors are, um, just like some Chinese people are, uh, some white people are, you know, some religious people are, but some doctors are in favour, uh, some Chinese people are in favour, some white people are in favour, and some religious people are in favour. So every group of people, there are people who are for and people who are against. Um, we know from surveys of doctors that <coughs> about one in six or about 3,000 doctors are willing to help people in their life under this kind of legislation. Um, so, you know, there's 3,000 doctors out there who, who may be willing to help you. I think that's a pretty good start. Yeah. Oh, mm. That's all for the end of lecture as well. Mm. So, mm. next question is about the flag tax mm. uh, policy. Mm. So, uh, the Flag test policy has never been uh, has never worked anywhere mm. else in the world. So, mm. for kind of for what kind of reason do you think mm. it can work in? Well, 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 that's not true. First of all, there's around 20 countries, uh, countries in Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. uh, places like Hong Kong. You know, th these countries have flat taxes, and they've generally had better and faster economic growth than than other countries. Mm -hmm. um, so, it is a successful policy. Mm -hmm. um, but number two, even if no other country has a flat tax. Um, so what? Yeah. New Zealand has often done things first and better. You know, in 1893, no other country had votes for women. New Zealand led the world. Uh, you know, in, New Z New Z in 1989, no other country had an independent reserve bank. New Zealand led the world. Um, and there's a reason that we lead the world. It's because New Zealanders are people who have moved all the way to the most remote country on earth for a better life. We're, we're pioneers and um, you know we should have the best policy and a flat tax is the fairest because every dollar gets taxed the same. It's the most aspirational because we say if you work hard and invest and get better skills and do overtime and earn more money, you get to keep it. And that's what, what the signal we should be sending. You know, I look at Chinese parents and they send their kids to school, and in many cases, they then send them to school after the school, they go to another school, yeah. and they tell them to do their homework. Um, and they tell them, you've got to work hard and be a success, and I agree with that. Then the Inland Revenue Department comes along and says, if you earn over $70,000, we'll increase your tax rate and punish you. Well, that's not right. Uh, the flat tax is an aspirational value. And there's one more, well, there's two more big advantages. The third advantage 
is that it's easy to administer. So you don't have all this complex accounting of who pays how much tax and should you put it in the company or pay yourself next year or whatever. Um, everything is taxed at the same rate, so simple. Um, and the, th the fourth advantage is that politically, you know, at the moment there's a whole lot of people who vote for higher taxes because they don't feel like they pay any. They think taxes are for other people. Well, meanwhile, there's a whole lot of people that ta pay a lot of tax uh, and they feel like they're victims of those other people. I want to have one tax rate and then we can have a national conversation about what our tax rate should be. And people can say, well, I think the tax rate should go up so that we can pay for more education or healthcare. Other people will say, we think the tax rate is too high and it should be lower. But if you have one rate, you can have a national conversation about the income tax rate. Whereas right now, tax is actually a way of dividing people and there's too much division in world politics. Yeah, I see. Thank you. Mm. And uh, next question is about the Arms Amendment Act. Mm. Uh, you vote against mm. it. Mm. So mm. would you please specify the reasons mm. you mm. vote against it? Yeah, look, first of all, um, after our nation's tragedy in Christchurch on March 15, mm. we needed to be together. Mm. And what the Prime Minister did was take a couple of hundred thousand people, quite a number of people in the Chinese community, I might add, who did nothing wrong, are licensed firearm owners who follow all the laws, and publicly punished them for what one person did. Mm -hmm. And I think that's wrong. That is a way of creating division. But the second thing is that the laws they introduced won't make us any safer. You know, this so-called gun buyback, well, last I checked, they've only got back about 30,000 firearms when there's allegedly 240,000 out there. So where did all those other firearms go? You know, nobody knows. Uh, so that's a really big problem. Um, number two um, is that, okay, let, let's just say that you've got um, a desire to make us safer. What we should have done is asked what went wrong. So here's a guy who's just arrived from Australia. He's got no friends or family here. He's traveled to countries like North Korea and Saudi Arabia, and he's a bit weird. Now, how did he get a firearm license? Well, the story's gonna come out, and people are gonna be shocked at how the police allowed this guy to get a license and buy firearms. Um, that is a real problem. And none of the stuff that's being done right now is going to stop that. Mm -hmm. uh, all, of, all they're currently doing is punishing people who follow the law because one person broke the law. Uh, so we need to be safer. We need to include people and make them feel dignified. Um, and we need to be a country that makes laws in a proper, respectable way. Um, and right now, we're failing at all of that. So will you propose some amendments mm. to the arms? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, we need to start again. Uh, we need a system that is based on punishing uh, people that break the law and gives respect and dignity to people who go through the process and get properly vetted to be licensed firearm owners. Uh, we should focus less on the types of firearms that they have and focus more on the character of the people. Because right now it's been too easy for bad people to get firearm licenses and too hard for good people to follow the law and we need to go back the other way. Vet people properly, then trust them, uh, instead of uh, vetting people poorly, then punishing everybody with a license. Mm. Uh, recently, recently there is a new party that mm. uh, launched. Mm. Uh, it's, it is called Sustainable Party. Mm. So the Sustainable Party mm. prom promised putting one billion dollars mm. to environment. Mm. protection. So mm. do you think it is practical? Well, it, it's practical, but they've got to get votes first. Um, mm. So every election, um, there's a new party, usually a couple of new parties, um, and they all say that they're going to be the star and they're going to go to parliament. And usually they have a lot of money and usually they have big personalities um, and they get some attention, but they don't get any votes. Um, so, you know, we've had Colin Craig, we've had Kim.com, we've had Gareth Morgan. And they all had lots of money, big personalities, and they didn't get into Parliament. Um, this new party doesn't appear to have any money, 
Um, it doesn't have a very good personality, so mm -hmm. I predict it'll get less than 1%. Okay. And um, speaking of environment, mm -hmm. so there is another video that just passed the third reading, mm -hmm. the zero mm -hmm. carbon video. Mm -hmm. So uh, you also vote against it? Absolutely. So what's your reasons? Uh, well, two reasons. One is that it requires New Zealanders to reduce their emissions by buying carbon credits from within New Zealand. Now, if you want to plant trees to absorb carbon dioxide, it shouldn't matter if those trees are in New Zealand or in South America, because it's all one big sky. Um, and if New Zealanders can reduce their emissions by paying Brazilians to reforest the Amazon, uh, what's the problem? It's cheaper, it's better for the environment, everyone's happy. This law requires us to use carbon credits uh, purchased only from New Zealand. And what does that mean? It means people end up planting trees all over New Zealand where most people don't want them. So you've got all these farmers losing their land, being planted out in pine trees, which are actually bad for the environment because pine trees are not native to New Zealand, they're not supposed to be here, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and paying more money on your groceries, on your petrol, um, on your electricity, um, in order to plant trees in New Zealand when we could have been paying them to be planted elsewhere. So that's number one. Number two is that the bill requires uh, the minister to make a plan for each sector of the economy. So you imagine the steel mills. Uh, you've got a steel mill at Glenbrook, which is um, you know, viable but it can't afford to pay much more in terms of carbon costs. So you imagine a minister making a plan for the steel sector. The minister under this legislation effectively gets to decide whether that business lives or dies based on their plan. You imagine how much lobbying is going to go on and how much effort is going to go into paying people um, to, to try and influence the minister because he can control their business. New Zealand's been down this path. Mm -hmm. Frankly, China is still on this path uh, and we don't want to go there. We want an open democracy with no corruption.